Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it, with the new Galaxy S24 Ultra, and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. Let me give you a big Labor Day surprise. Most people think if we all exercise the same and eat the same, we'd all look the same. And let me tell you why that's wrong. Your body is unique and your metabolism is unique. I'm Lacey Green, and I'm a super trainer at Body. That's B-O-D-I dot com. And you can't see me, but I don't look like your average personal trainer. I'm curvy, and I'm proud of it. So I created a program for beginners only on the Body app to show people like us how to get incredible results and be our version of happy and healthy. This isn't just workout videos. Videos. It's people like you and me. It's community. It's incredible trainers. It's easy to follow nutrition and mindset experts to help you reduce stress and just feel better. And you can get started with my new program called For Beginners Only. Now, here's the big surprise. If you go to body.com right now, that's B O D I.com, not only can you get everything Body has to offer at 50% off with an annual membership, you'll also get an additional 20% off, but only during Labor Day weekend. Let's do this together. Go to body.com. That's body with an I dot com. Hello, Duke fans, and welcome to episode 366 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It is Saturday morning, December 11th. 2021 just two weeks till christmas hope you are doing your shopping early this year the blue devils got another christmas present yesterday got two i would say that duke got two christmas presents yesterday and and i think we're going to have to talk about both of them the first is five-star basketball recruit mark mitchell who committed yesterday afternoon uh, in a video to duke he had his family around him they were were all putting on duke hats and he had a brotherhood t-shirt on the you know the whole gambit uh mike elko also comes to duke as the new uh, head coach for the football team he was previously the defensive coordinator at texas a&m among a number of other jobs he's been in the industry for a long time we are obviously going to talk at some point about the fact that duke has three basketball games coming up this week the first of which is against south carolina state on tuesday but we will save that preview for another episode we will save Mike Elko for after the break because, guys, we have to talk about Mark Mitchell. Before we do that, I will be – I guess I should introduce myself. I don't know if I said this yet. I'm Sam Klein. I'm your host. Donald Wine and Jason Evans are also here, as they always are. Donald, I'll come to you first. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Yes, yesterday was a great day uh, for Duke, both in football and in basketball, and I'm ready to talk about both of them. Awesome. We will do that as soon as we say good morning to Jason Evans. So I want to thank both of you because, uh, you know, yesterday, midday or so, we were like, yeah, we're going to wait. We'll record later in the weekend. We'll put something out next week to preview the new the, the games coming up, you know, because Duke's had an exam break. We, we wanted to talk about what Duke's been working on over the exam break. And then Mark Mitchell happened. And then Mike Elko happened, and I was like, guys, please, can we hop on early tomorrow? So thanks, guys. I appreciate you guys making time for this. So it allows us to talk to the audience. Yeah, Duke Athletics really going with the uh, the Friday afternoon news dump. <laughs> the Friday here. news dump. <laughs> yeah. The, the, Friday, the Friday good news dump, uh, yes. which I don't know. I don't know exactly who's coordinating these things. I assume that Mark Mitchell is just going on his own timeline. But man, good news is supposed to happen like in the middle of the week. You know, Monday morning is time for good news. Friday afternoon. What are, what are we doing? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they were I'm not in at, charge. I'm not in charge of the PR here. Look, for for the Elko, and we'll talk about this in a second, but they were saying, hey, we're going to announce this sometime this weekend, but we didn't know when. So on Friday morning, I'm like, okay, Friday morning, great time to drop a new coach. No. Friday afternoon, great time to drop a new coach. No. Friday evening, cool. Let's do it. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And... and and there were rumors, we, we, can, we can talk about that afterwards, but there were also rumors about lots of other potentially uh, going to get that job basically right up until the announcement was made. So, all right, we'll, we'll talk about 
Coach Elko after the break. I said we have to start with Mark Mitchell. We are still Duke basketball report, and this is a five-star commitment for Duke. So I'll give you the, the skinny on Mitchell and how he fits in the program, and then I need to get Jason and Donald's reaction to the commitment and what it means for Duke. So Mitchell, uh, for those who are not aware, we, we don't assume that the audience uh, here is, is watching every recruiting video that comes down the pipe for them for every player that is interested in Duke. Mitchell is a 6'8 wing. He, he's kind of a, he's a wing, but he can also play a little bit inside. He uh, is originally from Kansas and has been a, a top recruit pretty much you know the whole time through his, his high school career, was holding offers from all kinds of great programs, UCLA, UNC, Kansas. Uh, Missouri was in his was in his final group, but ultimately he selects Duke. He is the fifth member of the class of 2022 to commit to rising head coach John Shire. He joins uh, three other five star commitments who already are are coming and guys we've already talked about Derek Lively, Derek Whitehead and Kyle Filipowski. Duke also has four star Jaden shoot in the class. So if you look sort of at that at that roster of players, Duke has basically recruited a, uh, a whole a whole lineup to uh, to come in next year. I do not think necessarily that they will all uh, they will all be in the starting lineup, but uh, should that should that need arise, Duke has Duke has recruited an entire uh, an entire group of players to be on the floor together. So that is awesome. I want to talk about first Mark Mitchell, the player, and then I want to talk about how he fits on the roster. And Jason, I want to start with you. Give me a bit of the scouting report on Mark Mitchell and where his strengths and weaknesses are you know, headed into his, his senior season. And then, and then obviously coming to Duke next year. So this kid's um, got a really nice build. One of the first things that will strike you is he has very broad shoulders, uh, which is a, a valuable aspect. If you're, if you're going to go in the post and bang a little bit, which he's very much capable of doing. He's six, eight around 210 pounds. Um, a, 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 like I said, broad shoulders, very solid frame. Um, he's considered a combo forward. He can absolutely play power forward. You know, if you want him to go in there, uh, he's a very, very good rebounder. If you want him to go in and play in the post, he's extremely comfortable doing that, but he's probably more of a wing slasher type. Uh, Mark Mitchell is not someone known for his outside shooting. He's not someone who you're going to say, this is a guy that's going to put up, you know, four or five three-point attempts a game. Um, but he's he's considered a decent outside shooter. That's something that that's expected to improve uh, in, in his college game as he, you know, as he advances towards what most people think is, you know, his inevitable future as a NBA first round draft pick, not necessarily as a lottery pick, but but probably almost certainly as an NBA first rounder at some point. Um, he's a lefty um, and he finishes really he uses either hand. He can finish with either hand, but, you know, prefers his left uh, lefties to me are, are always seem, you know, they're a little different. They're a little crafty defenses have trouble even if you know a guy's a lefty you're just not used to to defending him you know the way you have to with a lefty so that's that gives him an advantage um he's got really good explosion around the basket uh and and just has a, a you know a, a nice skill set he's got long arms <clears throat> and uh, he's capable of guarding multiple positions he's a good defender and the reputation on him is you know, like i say slasher a guy who's going to score you know by using his size his physicality um, and and either hand around the basket and and a really really good defender who can guard multiple positions, which is something Duke's going to really like. I think uh, I I love the fact that this class is coming in. Most of them coming in with reputations as great defenders. Between him, Derek Lively, and Derek Whitehead, you arguably have the best uh, defensive wing in Whitehead. At Whitehead, the best sort of defensive forward in Mitchell, and easily the best rim protector in Lively. That is a great defensive start to this class. And obviously the the makeup of the Duke roster changes a lot year to year. But one of the things that I have found, it seems that Duke is focusing on more in recent years is making sure to get those guys that have elite defensive skills because the the ability for a bunch of fresh, you know, a lot of freshmen and sophomores that are that are getting the big minutes for Duke these days, the ability for them to step on the court right away and play defense is such a game changer for a program that is filled with young talent where we would have said, you know, seven, eight years ago, 10 years ago, when Duke was kind of starting off in the, in the one and done world, those, some of the early commitments for Duke were guys like Kyrie Irving, Austin Rivers, very, very talented offensive players, but not the guys that you were like, Oh, well, they're going to, they're going to lock it up on defense. Now Duke is, is getting players like Trey Jones, uh, players like Zion Williamson, uh, 
uh, you know, this year players like, like Trevor Keels, guys who have, who have some real defensive ability. And I love that, that John Shire is, is continuing that into the future. Donald, I want to get your take on Mark Mitchell. Um, how do you think, uh, how do you think he translates, uh, as a, as a Duke basketball player next year? Well, you talked about the defense and I wanted to start there because like Jason said, he is very good inside. He's very strong and on offense, he can finish with contact, but that also means he can absorb contact on the defensive end and still make a play. And when you watch his highlights, you see him make a lot of plays, which is good. And when you translate that to the next level, the biggest learning curve is learning how to play defense at a collegiate level. And that is why getting strong defensive players is a must for a lot of programs because they don't want to spend a lot of that time on the learning curve. You can always learn offense very quickly, but being able to play team defense quickly is important to become an elite team. And we've seen that so far this year from Duke. We've seen that so far this year from Gonzaga and a couple of other elite programs. So it's natural that we're going to try and continue that progression. What I'm interested in is how he fits in, you know, with the rest of the group, because like you said, we kind of have a starting five um, that are coming in next year. We also have some guys that, and if you look at this year's roster, not to, you know, speculate too much uh, into the wind, but you know, Jeremy Roach probably going to come back. Jalen Blakes is probably going to come back. Then you have a couple, a few guys who are like, I wonder if they do come back. Like, you know, Wendell Moore obviously is having a career year. He could go either way. AJ Griffin could go either way. Trevor Keels could go either way. He's not a surefire first rounder, but he's someone that I could see go and I could also see stay another year. The dynamic of this team changes with the five that are coming in right now. Uh, along with some of these guys who could stay. And I think that is why, you know, we're going after a defensive minded team because some of those guys that are coming back are some of those guys that are really, really good on defense and can teach this team to be really, really elite when it comes to defense and, and not necessarily be a pack line defense like UVA, but a, a team where people come into Cameron, they know they're not going to score 60 points. Yeah. I think that, the roster situation is interesting. And Jason, I want to come back to you to, to talk about it. But um, looking ahead to next year, as Donald sort of previewed, there are a lot of guys on Duke's roster that may come back. They may stay. They may decide that they're not ready for the NBA. And, and, and maybe, unfortunately, they have to transfer because of all the, all the talent that's loaded up at Duke uh, between, between the, the current players and, and next year's players. So that's going to be something to watch. I do feel like Duke is is done on the recruiting trail for this year. It feels like, you know, even if you take the the worst version of of everyone at Duke who could possibly declare for the draft leaving and and you know, seniors leaving, Theo John's not going to be there uh for another year, but um even then Duke still feels like it's fairly loaded with talent, right Jason? Oh yeah, unquestionably. I I mean, you know, like Donald said, you look at this class, it it, it contains four or five star guys one's a center in Derek lively one is a power forward in kyle filipowski you have drake whitehead who's a combo forward i'm sorry uh, drake whitehead's more of a you know a, a wing uh, you know could almost be a shooting guard probably more of a small forward mark mitchell's a combo forward and and jaden shoot jaden shoot is is the shooting guard he's the he's the designated score from that the only thing missing in that in that five-man class is a point guard and and as we've said it seems extremely, extremely likely that Jeremy Roach will will return to be the the starting point guard for the team next year. I mean, he's the starting point guard this year. It, it, it is a very, very complete class and, and about as good as you can imagine anyone doing. And I love the fact that when Mitchell declared, he, he had this little diary blog, whatever you want to call it, that he that he gave to Sports Illustrated. Um, and, and he talked about the fact that these guys know that they are the first Duke class without Coach K, and they want to prove that Duke will continue to be Duke. God, I loved reading that. I, I mean, for these guys to have got together, and it's not just about John Shire. Uh, it's not just about them. It's about them recognizing the importance of Duke and the Brotherhood and maintaining that, you know, mystique, so to speak. Um, Mitchell says that he made his decision after the Gonzaga game. I think it's worth noting that Gonzaga played UCLA and blew UCLA out. Then they played Duke and played this incredible game with this unbelievable atmosphere where, where Duke ended up winning, controlled pretty much the whole game and ended up winning the game down the stretch. And, and Mark Mitchell said he made his decision after that. I think it was impossible not to sort of compare 
the UCLA crowd that came to Las Vegas to the Duke crowd that came to Las Vegas. And he was like, I want to be a part of that atmosphere. And, and that, that to me is just a, a great little comment. I think the other thing that struck me about Mark Mitchell's an announcement yesterday is he mentioned that one, he had been chatting with John Shire every single day about life. Uh, and, and we've seen that from these guys. This is kind of a constant theme here where all of them are saying that, yeah, you know, the coaching staff is reaching out every single day, but especially John Shire reaching out just to not necessarily talk basketball, but to get to know them. And they're also talking basketball as well. He also mentioned that he's been in a group chat with the other four guys uh, for the last few months. Again, the group checks, uh, the group chat strikes again. So uh, it, it happened in 2019 with Zion, RJ and, and Cam. They all were in a group chat, just basically got everyone in. If you become a part of the brotherhood group chat, you know you're in for it because it's undefeated right now. So, uh, but the great thing about it is that these guys are going to come in. They're going to know each other well. And all of them are talking about how they can complement each other on the court at the same time, which means that it opens up a world of opportunities where, yes, you could do an all you know freshman lineup if you wanted to, or just talking with the rest of the guys that are currently on this team, how they're all going to mix well together. I don't think we'll have to worry about that when this team comes in next year. So, so two other really quick things. One thing uh, to build on what you were saying there, Donald, um, uh, Whitehead talked about the fact that he took his visit, his official visit to Duke was the same time Derek Lively. Uh, sorry, I said Whitehead. I, I mean, Mitchell. <laughs> when, when when Mark Mitchell took his visit, Lively, Whitehead and Filipowski were all also on visits that those those four guys visited at the same time together and they really bonded. I think the group chat kind of came out of that. They, they then brought Jaden shut in uh, Jaden shoot into it. And I, 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 I agree. I love the fact that these guys, you know, are already developing this, this kind of relationship. Uh, the other thing I love is that I don't hear any of them talking about, you know, oh, you know, my opportunity and, and starting and all that other kind of stuff, because there's got to be a recognition. I, I, I love the fact that we got Mark Mitchell because I'm not sure that Mark Mitchell looks at this roster and says, I'm definitely starting for that team next year. And the fact that he wants to be a part of the program, regardless of whether he has sort of guaranteed playing time, tells me this is a guy who's willing to come in and work for his playing time and work to be part of something bigger. And I'm not saying Mark Mitchell's not going to start. But if there's a world where Wendell Moore does come back or Trevor Keels does come back, you start to start to look, you start to wonder, I, I Mark Mitchell, where AJ and, Griffin, and, where AJ Griffin comes back and plays as well as yes. he's supposed to be playing. Yes. Right. Because he, mm -hmm. he's coming off injury. And Mark Mitchell, by the way, is also coming off some injuries. So, yeah, um, yeah I, Jason, I agree with you. There is no guarantee that he's starting next year. I think he's he's probably playing a lot of minutes, but we know from the AJ Griffin experience this year and we've had this happen in prior years. Marquise Bolden's another one just because you come in as a top 20 recruit does not mean that you're automatically getting playing time uh, or significant playing time in your freshman season. And also just, you know, again, this is a common theme amongst this class. When we had Kyle Filipowski on here a few episodes ago, he mentioned about, you know, playing with Derek Lively. He goes, yo, I can come off the bench and compliment him, or we could both be in the game at the same time and compliment him. So even two top 10, two top five uh, athletes are saying, hey, one of us may not start, and I will, I will be able to play with whoever is on the court, but when we're on the court, you don't have to choose between the two of us. We can play and compliment each other. I think all of these guys are sitting there thinking, okay, all of us can play different positions on the court at the same time. And if all of us don't start, that's also not a big deal either because wherever our role is, we'll be able to play it and play it well. Yeah, and, and by the way, not starting doesn't mean... Uh, uh, look, A.J. Griffin has has struggled to find a role for this Duke team. And, and in competitive games, we've seen that A.J. Griffin is not playing double-digit minutes. I, I think a lot of that is due to injury and, and finding his you know, finding his way back from years of injury. So I don't think that applies at all to, to Mark Mitchell, but I, I, I absolutely think even if you don't start, it's very easy to see uh, these guys are probably going to be playing 25 plus minutes per game. There are going to be plenty of minutes available. I would suspect next year. And I don't know which one of these guys is not the starter. It's probably Filipowski or, or Mitchell, but I can't tell you that for certain. And I, I and they'll all get to campus. They'll start battling each other. And we've heard over the years again and again and again, 
you work hard and practice against really good competition, suddenly the games are a lot easier. And there's going to be some really great competition in practice at Duke next year. Um, and, and, you know, by the way, maybe, maybe Mitchell committing says that the Duke staff expects to lose a lot of these guys that we're uncertain of. Perhaps that's the case. If it is, this is still going to be an incredibly talented Duke team for John Shire's first season. I think Duke at this point kind of has to recruit on the, on the assumption that most guys are going to leave because, you know, it, it's, it's yeah, basically absolutely. not just for Duke this place. It's, um, it, it's, uh, you know, it's an every year thing for recruiting it, and whether that's looking at the transfer market, looking at high school players, um, Duke, Duke and every other major program has to remake their roster every summer. So why not get a head start on it in the most reliable way to do it, honestly, is to get uh, is to get the players that are being recruited in because the players who are currently playing for the program have no mechanism to to officially commit for next year. Right. And, and you mentioned the transfer portal. Obviously, that's going to be the last piece of this they'll you know basically take a look at who does leave and who does stay and then they can look at the transfer portal accordingly and and look let's not underrate the fact i mean theo john is a hugely important player on this team the transfer portal is is a big deal i don't know that duke's going to be the kind of program that's going to bring in you know a difference maker scorer um or or starter from the transfer portal i don't i don't think you're going to see a lot of that from duke what you're going to see is that backfill those guys like theo john who become hugely important 15 minute per game uh, subs, you know, your, your sixth, seventh, eighth man. I think you're going to see a lot of that from Duke from the transfer portal uh, under John Shire. So that's it on Mark Mitchell. I think that Duke is, as I was saying, Duke is probably done on the recruiting front for there, there are no season, other. Let, let's, let's be clear. There are no other. These things are going to play out. There, there are no other existing offers that are out there right now. There's nobody that Duke has reached out to and said, we are recruiting you. Here is an offer. Please come. So we don't think uh, a name could crop up. There'll, there'll probably be some kid who plays great and, you know, and, and his name crops up or there'll be a kid who decommits from somewhere or something like that. It, 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 it usually happens, but at this point, we don't know who it would be. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if this Duke class is done, uh, you know, Sam at this point. And by the way, it's the number one class in the land. Definitely. And, and, and that's what that's what all the analysts are saying at this point uh, about Duke's class, be it two, four, seven, ESPN, whoever uh, the Duke basketball report, who, of course, is the is the best source for for ranking all the recruiting classes, because we, of course, cover every single school's recruiting. But we will leave the recruiting talk there. We we do. As I said, we do have to come back at some point and talk about the game upcoming against South Carolina State. But right now we're going to take a break when we get back. We're going to talk about Duke's new football coach, Mike Elko. So stick around. As we mentioned before the break, Duke has a new uh, head coach in football. It's Mike Elko. He was most recently the defensive coordinator at Texas A&M for the last four seasons under Jimbo Fisher. Uh, he is going to be succeeding David Cutcliffe. This is the first time Duke has had to hire a football coach in almost 15 years. Now, Coach Elko comes without any head coaching experience, but he has spent a long time as a Division I defensive coordinator, not just uh, at Texas A&M, but at Notre Dame. He spent a few years at Wake Forest and then at, at lower level D1 football uh, in stints at, at Bowling Green and Hofstra. Uh, one other sort of fun biographical note about Elko, uh, I, I, I was looking that uh, elitists and proletarians alike will note that uh, Elko did his undergraduate studies at University of Pennsylvania. So uh, if you Oak want Quakers. to, if you, that's right. If you want to make the connection that, that Duke is hiring guys like that for quote unquote cultural fit reasons, um, you can you can look at that. I will say that, that Duke's most recent head coach, David Cutcliffe, uh, went would went to did his undergraduate studies in the SEC, spent his whole career in the SEC. So I'm not sure that it's necessarily a a uh, requirement to succeed at Duke uh, coming from uh, from that kind of background. But it is sort of a fun a fun side note. So, uh, Donald, I'll come to you first. What do you think about Mike Elko uh, as Duke's 22nd head football coach? I like it. And you mentioned the SEC. He is also coming from the SEC uh, as A&M is currently there. I know a lot of us grew up when they were in the big eight slash big 12 era, uh, but they are the SEC. So I guess that culture kind of continues a little bit, but 
Uh, the great thing about him is that he normally employs a really good defense. I want to give some statistics uh, from his defenses as a defensive coordinator. Uh, they don't have the stats out for this year because this current co- Carl's football season is not yet done. Uh, but last year in 2020, Texas A&M was a ninth ranked total defense in the country. They had the second best passing. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the second best rushing defense uh, in the country. He also had a couple of times at Bowling Green where his total defense was sixth and 10th. That was 2012, 2013. Now, a lot of you guys have never seen Bowling Green play football, but I have. And I'm going to tell you, it's very, very difficult to become an elite defensive team in the MAC, much less one that is top 10 in the country. Wait, wait, and he wait, did don't, it don't, two years ago. Can, can I ask, how have you seen Bowling Green play football? Bowling Green is in the MAC. Okay. A lot of you guys know I grew up in Michigan. I grew up literally directly across the street from Eastern Michigan. A ton of friends have played. I have a ton of friends that have played at Bowling Green, a ton of friends that have actually been like graduate assistants or like, you know, safeties coaches or running backs coaches at Bowling Green. A Ziggy Zumba to all my friends out there. But I will say this. And by the way, all the, all those Mac games are on Tuesday nights. So you never, you can watch, it's never like, it's never like you're watching is, is a real deal. You're, you're not flipping between the SEC and the Mac. If you want to watch the Mac, you have, you have a whole night for it in the fall. <laughs> right. But for me, growing up in that part of the country, the Mac is everywhere, just like the Big Ten is everywhere. So, again, like you said, on Tuesday nights, you can watch all of the Mac you want. You could go to games and then, you know, basically get your homework done in high school and then go to an Eastern Michigan football game if you so desired. And then, you know, wait for the big games of Michigan and or Michigan State on Saturday. So, but for Bowling Green to come from there, it's obviously, you know, something that Mike Elko has been building on throughout these years. And again, you know, being a top five, top 10 defense anywhere in the country is great. But obviously to do it in the SEC means you had some really gr- good talent coming in uh, and coming through there. So Mike Elko is, uh, is someone that I think is going to be really good on the defensive end. It's going to be great because. I think what this also sets up is for him to be able to bring in some very, very good assistance on all sides of the football, particularly the offense. We, we know we talked a little bit this year about the offense stagnating a little bit, the defense just kind of being so tired that they started giving up a ton of points. Hopefully both of those will be locked down a little bit better under Mike Elko, especially on the defensive side. And I will say on a personal note, I think it's much better for Mike Elko to be there than some of the other names that we are hearing all the way up until the last minute, like Jason Garrett. Jason Garrett, uh, as of 5.59 Eastern time last night, was the front runner to be the Duke head coach. And at 6 o'clock or so, they announced Mike Elko. The old bait and switch, ladies and gentlemen. It was great to have them out there because while everyone was talking about Jason Garrett, they were quietly on the side negotiating with Mike Elko. Donald, I was following that news all this week and trying to figure out, you know, it, it, it's. I think it's hard to have a nuanced opinion from my perspective about you know, who's which top programs defensive coordinator I would rather have as a head coach. Um, Because I know that Clemson's defensive coordinator was also in the mix here before he was hired at at Virginia. Um, But there's a stark contrast between thinking about, you know, another program's defensive coordinator and Jason Garrett, you know, longtime NFL head coach and and NFL assistant that that, that there's a there's a huge like philosophical difference between hiring those two types of coaches. I had actually come around to the idea of Jason Garrett by the time Friday afternoon rolled around. I'm, I'm they, exactly the then, same. Yeah. I was like my, my thinking, cause we know, oh, we know how much Jason Garrett's a Duke fan. He comes to, he comes to games every year that they always make a big deal out of it. Even though he's like, you know, like he, he was, he was a fine NFL head coach. He's not like a legendary NFL head coach. He just happened to coach the Cowboys. Um, but, uh, but I, I feel like it would have been, would have been a very interesting thing to have, to have a, a longtime NFL guy in there. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I, I think at the end of the day, I, I'm actually glad that, that Duke went this way. What were you going to say? Donald? The, the biggest joke about the Jason Garrett rumors was a lot of people were like, Hey, I mean, if Duke really wants him, that's fine. But I'm going to tell you something, guys, he's just going to mess around and he's just going to go six and six. And like all these Duke people will be in the replies going six and six would be terrific. That takes us to a bowl game. We will be <laughs> terrifically fine with that. Six and six most consistent coach ever. Just let's do that. Let's let's go. Six. And I six wonder. Every year. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what it feels like to be a fan of a college football team where I'm not happy going to a bowl game, just going to a bowl game every year. Like, right. If that's what it takes. Fine. Give me that. Give me that stepping stone. 
Uh, look, the, the key with Mike Elko, uh, I, I think, is I, I want to see who he gets on his staff. Uh, I, I think it's a great hire. This is a guy whose name has been uh, tossed around for for a lot of head coach, a lot of head coaching opportunities over the years. And, and I'm thrilled that, that Duke has gotten him. He is clearly qualified. I mean, look, guy's been a defensive coordinator for 18 years. Uh, he's been a, a DC at the power five level for the past eight seasons. He, he did three years at Wake Forest where he built them into one of the best defenses in the ACC. I, I, I mean, I, you know, he's he clearly only 44. Knows, huh? He's only 44. Like, yeah, he's, exactly. I mean, he's been coaching basically since he left college. Oh, yeah. I, I, and he he's ready for this job. He can be in the job for a long time. But to me, the key is who's he going to get to to surround him? Because um, football, unlike I feel like unlike basketball, football is a game where you've got to got to got to have not just good coordinators, but, a, a, but the entire staff. I mean, Sam, you know better than anybody because you've been, you know, a, a part of the, the, the staff, so to speak, a, a, you know, not, not in a paid capacity, but y- you understand how I, it that's works. That's not true. I was making, uh, I, I was making, uh, you know, barely starvation wages to be a, uh, <laughs> I was making less than minimum wage. Staff member. <laughs> it was like 647 <laughs> per hour. And they're only they only kept you at twenty because oh. they had kept everyone. Oh, when at I was uh, when I was when I was there, they had raised us up to the uh, to the the TA salary, which like was ten mm. or twelve bucks an hour. So yeah, I was y'all, I was y'all, and, y'all and rolling a lot of free food. So yeah, I was I was crushing it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the thing I was gonna uh, the point I was making was, of course, we need to see who he brings in, mostly on the offensive side, because the guy's such a he's a great defensive coach. There's zero question about that. And I feel like Duke's defense is going to be even more competitive under him. The question is, what? who does he bring in to be his offensive coordinator? He's never coached on the offensive side of the ball. So, uh, you know, he, he he's going to need a good offensive coordinator. And by the way, Mateo Durant has moved on to the draft. Uh, Duke's best wide receiver, Mike Bobo, has has entered the transfer portal. Doesn't mean he's automatically gone. We could try and bring him back, but but it means he's at, at least strongly thinking about that. And he's sort of mentally said goodbye to Duke and I don't blame him. There's nothing wrong with that. Mike Bobo has given Duke some very, very, very good years. Uh, no, no one even really knows what Gunnar Holmberg is going to do. He, he, he's capable of doing whatever he wants either via the portal, or if he wants to just move on with his life, he's been at Duke for a while now. So, so there's a lot on offense that needs to be fixed. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Mike Elko is going to take advantage of the transfer portal. The other direction as well. I, I bet he's going to be out there, really looking in the portal to see who he can get immediately to have an impact at Duke. Um, it's not going to be recruiting as a first priority uh, in terms of recruiting freshmen. It's going to be recruiting guys through the portal, in my opinion. I, I know we joked about this at the beginning of the show about the news dumpiness of this announcement being Friday night, but there was a reason to it being announced on Friday night, and it's because the signing day for football is on Wednesday and they wanted to get a coach in and they had talked about this, getting a coach in before the end of the week so that they could spend the weekend making a final ditch to uh, recruit to, uh, to a lot of recruits out there to get those who were still considering Duke to keep them solidly on and then to go maybe get a couple more people before signing day opens up on Wednesday. So I think there was some method to the madness of, of, announcing this so late on Friday night was because they want to get Elko out there on the road to say, Hey, I'm the new Duke coach. Here's how we're going to do things in Durham. And we want to, we want to see you at the Gothic Wonderland. La- last word on, on Mike Elko for me. I-, I love that Duke hired a guy coming over from the sec. The sec is big boy football. Uh, I, you know, you're going through the gauntlet of Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Auburn every week. In the SEC, it's a murderer's row, as we are all very, very aware. And against that backdrop, Mike Elko in 2021 had the number three scoring defense in all of college football. That's that's amazing. That's incredibly impressive. And Texas A&M playing not in the a, SEC West. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Texas A&M not a program, you know, historically known for great defense. They, they've been, you know, their best years have been years where they're they're like, okay, we're going to put up 48. See if you can put up more than that. This is not a team that goes, okay, we're going to beat you 20 to 17. But under Mike Elko, teams were only scoring like 15 and a half points per game against Texas A&M. That is super, super impressive. This guy knows how to coach. I'm thrilled that Duke got him. I'll be honest. When I heard the names that were possibilities for Duke and his name was one of them, I was like, Duke's not getting Mike Elko. I didn't think we were going to get this guy. 
and and it is a big deal you know props to nina king we haven't said her name yet huge mad props to nina king her her two major hires now uh, you know are 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 john shire who we just spent the first half of the podcast talking about how he's assembled the number one recruiting class in the country and mike elko who i think is another home run a, a great hire and and like you guys mentioned 44 years old i i dearly hope and i expect that mike elko will be the head coach at duke for 20 plus years that would be great news all right jason i have a couple reactions to that one don't forget that nina king also hired carol lawson yes yes Kevin White, I, not not Kevin officially though. technically the ad but yeah. but she ran that search so uh so hopefully this means so far three for three on good coaching hires and you're gonna say on, elko's not gonna be there for 20 years because he'll he'll do well and move on <laughs> i i i think that's the what are the most likely outcomes that he, yeah. that he doesn't do well and gets You're fired, right. that he does well and sticks around or that he does well and gets hired to go to a bigger program. I'm actually kind of hoping for he does well and gets hired by a bigger program. There's a, there's a part of me that, that sort of appreciates that Duke is not, you know, for, for most coaches is not the destination as a football coach that is, is probably a stepping stone to, Hey, you do well at Duke. And then maybe you get hired at university of Florida or, or whatever the, whatever the case may be, I'm referencing Steve Spurrier here, but, um, but that doesn't mean that he can't have four or five, six successful years at Duke rebuilding a, a program. The, the culture of which I think is still good. Um, I, I think inside the program, it's not like anything is, is bad at Duke. It's that I think things had just gotten a little bit stale the last few years and, and bringing in a guy with a defensive reputation who therefore is is definitely a departure from Coach Cutcliffe in that huge way, sort of signals that we're going to shake things up a little bit, not so much. I don't think we're hiring I don't think Duke is hiring someone that that is, you know, completely divorced from what Duke is trying to do as a program in football, but is different enough from from David Cutcliffe that everyone has to look up and say, all right, we're we're gonna try to reimagine enough things to get the program back to winning six or seven games a season. So I think it's important that you mention that, Sam, for this reason. You know, when we talk about recruiting players, players come to whatever school, they do well, they go to the NFL, they go to the NBA. Those coaches use that example to recruit bigger and better players, right? They, they'll they say, hey, we got, you know, we, we got Lake and Thomas into the NFL. So if you're a lineman, you should come to Duke because you're going to go to the NFL. We have that pathway for you. When it comes to coaching, as you guys know, in the professional ranks, I'm a Detroit Lions fan. Fun stat about the Detroit Lions. Since Willie Clay Ford bought the team in 1964, no coach, with the exception of one, who was an interim coach, and that was Dick Geron. He is the only coach that has coached the Detroit Lions and coached as a head coach in any other place in the NFL. Every single person looks at the Detroit Lions as a last stop. If we can get a coach that comes in, does really well for six, seven, eight years, whatever that is, and then gets plucked by a bigger program, we could then say, hey, there's a pathway for you to get to wherever you want. We have a culture that breeds success and not just for players, but for coaches. And I think that's important too. Coach Cutcliffe instilled that, that program and that culture where we can sit there and say, hey, we had a successful coach. Did it end the way we wanted to? No, I don't think it did. But we had a coach that was here and promoted stability, which is something we did not have. Now we can go to the next step and say, if Mike Elko could be successful and then, you know, several years from now gets, you know, gets courted by some of the major, you know, big time, you know, blue blood programs of, of football, then we can say, hey, look, Duke is a pathway for you guys to also be successful. It's not just about the players here. It's also about the coaches. Well, it's worth noting, David Cutcliffe was offered or at least courted for other jobs while he was at Duke, um, specifically the Tennessee job, and, and he chose to stay at Duke. But your point is well taken, Donald. You have to go all the way back to Steve Spurrier, and this is something really to think about. You have to go all the way back to Steve Spurrier to find a head coach at Duke who left because he was going someplace else, not because Duke was done with him. That's a sobering thing to think about. We have to fire these and guys or, or get, you know, get rid of them because things aren't going well. Spurrier's the last guy where things were going so well, he, he moved on. And Coach Cutcliffe, at least for the first half of his tenure, had a number of 
assistant coaches or, or coordinators who did get hired away at bigger programs. Kurt Roper got hired away. Yes, Darian Hobby yes. got hired away. Jim Knowles. So, so Coach Cutcliffe actually had created a little bit of that culture. We'll see if Mike Elko could do that. One final note, Jason, I need to correct you because you said that uh, Mike Bobo is the tight end who had, who had, or wide receiver who had transferred. He's, he's Jake Bobo. Jake Bobo. Um, I apologize. <laughs> we were I got too many mics. So you could have I got been, mics and marks and stuff like that in my brain. Sorry. <laughs> well, so, so, so it got me as you were talking, I was thinking, I was like, I wonder, did he, did he mentally confuse uh, Jake Bobo with Mike Elko? Cause those names are, are all eight letters, like same kind of setup, but there's also a football coach, Mike Elko. Or, or Mike Bobo? Mike Bobo. No, that, so, that's what I, I I did the Mike Bobo football coach who, because I'm a Georgia fan. I, you know, I, I grew up in Georgia and I still live here. Mike Bobo, the football coach, was closely associated with the UGA Bulldogs. So then I had to look at both of their profiles because now I was curious. Turns out they're not related, but Jake Bobo's dad is named Mike Bobo. Oh, oh, when Jake <laughs> Bobo, hold on, when Jake Bobo committed to Duke and they were like, you know, he's the son of Mike Bobo. I was like, wait a second. Cause you know, I'm like, I know who his dad is. In fact, I think, I think Mike no, Bobo but his, was. But it turns out, it turns out that Jake Bobo's dad played college football is and is named Mike Bobo and is not Mike Bobo. And is not Mike exactly. I, I did this like three years ago when when Jake Bobo, Bobo committed to Duke, and I was like, wait a second, is he? You know, it seems crazy, but yes. But that's why I had Mike Bobo on the on the brain, and I apologize, Jake. Jake is a great football player, and 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 I I apologize for butchering his name. I, I was wondering where the where the slip up came from. So it so it was from from actual Mike Bobo. OK, I, I don't have yes. to belabor yes. the belabor the point. Uh, those who were going to email us, those who were going to email us to correct Jason about that don't. But if you want to email us about anything else, DBR podcast at Gmail dot com. That is our email address. We love hearing from you. We'll be back very soon to talk about the games upcoming this week because Duke is out of the exam break. We need to brainstorm a little bit about what they were doing uh, in between in between study sessions. So for Jason Evans and for Donald Wine, I am Sam Klein. This has been episode 366 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. Welcome to Duke Mark Mitchell. Welcome to Duke uh, Mike Elko. We will talk to you again soon. Duke Band, take us home. Yeah.